This is an oral history of Betty Reagan. The interview was conducted by Rebecca Shawan at Betty Reagan's home in Oviedo, or in Lake Mary, Florida, mm -hmm. on April 2nd, 2015. Could you please state your full name and birth date for the record? Okay. Betty Jean Reagan, uh, January 27th, 1934. Uh, born in, actually, in the Sanford, in the hospital, which I was the first one in my family to be born in the hospital, everybody else was born at home, <laughs> which was in Oviedo, and uh, that's where I was raised. And what is one of your earliest childhood memories? My earliest childhood memories was we lived, uh, I don't know the name of the road, it goes, uh, it goes beside the Lawton House, where the Lawton House uh, there's one that goes towards Winter Park and the other one that comes beside it. We lived down that road across from where the school was. That was in a big old two-story house there. And one, I guess I'll never forget this, when I was, we moved out of that house when I was six years old. But uh, one day my little brother and I decided to go for a walk out and you went through the back. We had an, a garden and we had an orange grove and if you kept on going, there was a great big ditch there you walked over, which was scary. And we could go all the way to the, where the cemetery is today. It was there then, through the woods. And we decided we'd just go for And we went, which was unheard of. Today, it would be terrible. They would have called the police. <laughs> but And we're out there wandering around in the cemetery. And this lady who knew who we were came and got us and took us back home. And another time we went down there... And and I was going to fix it so my brother, who's two years younger than I am, he had to be, I was six, he was four. And I made him a fishing pole out of a stick, a piece of string, and I don't know how I did it, but I took a straight pin and bent it. We got some bread, and we tied that string on there, and we went down into that ditch that we had to cross over, which is really what it was, but it had water in it to fish and my little brother fell in head first and his there and his feet are sticking up and I pulled him out <laughs> it's covered with mud <laughs> but that was a scare I used to have nightmares after that about that it scared me so bad and another time at that same area where my daddy had planted all the strawberries I took the bucket one day and I picked every strawberry in the patch and they were all green so we didn't have strawberries that year <laughs> that's my first memories <laughs> but then I swear I started school in first grade and I got to go to school a year early I went when I was five my birthday was in January but you were but and you weren't supposed to go to school but uh, a man from Oveda Mr. Mr. Gore was a on school board and uh, his son was Frank, Frankie D. Gore. And he's a school, well, I guess he's not now, but he was a school teacher, grew up to be a school teacher. He got to go, his birthday was the same time I was. So my mom said, well, if you can go to school, if he can go, you can go. So they had to let me go. So I got to go to school when I was five and get out early. And those are some of the first things I remember. And what kind of games did you play as a young child? We, you know, we made up our games. We did things, I guess we couldn't say we, we, uh, I remember that uh, we took, they, we, we lived in another, we moved two more times, and we lived up where the, we were surrounded by orange groves. And every year when they got ready to pick the oranges, they would come out and they would dump all the cr orange crates if you know what an orange, old-fashioned orange box looks, it's got a division in the middle, and they would stack them. We would make a great fort. Me and my brother would get out there and make this great big fort, and uh, play in that. Then we would also fix a uh, a little thing in the backyard and play storekeeper. And in those days, you what you did with your garbage, you didn't have garbage collection. You dug a great big hole in your backyard somewhere and you put all the the trash that you had we put in the hole and then and you tried to burn it if you could and then you filled the hole in and you dig another hole but we would get anything that came in a carton a box 
and we would save all those and we would put them up on the table and we would play like we had a store and somebody came to the store and we would pull the this we got in trouble for this we pulled the leaves off the tr orange tree that was our money we made out like that was dollars and we would do that and we would uh play cops and robbers we we would get a little saw which my daddy had we weren't supposed to use and saw out little just a little thing that looked like a pistol but of course it wasn't it was just a little thing and we would run around and chase each other and then another time we decided we would go find Indian Mound we had a wild imagination I guess and we went out with a shovel and we found a little mound way away from the house. I don't know how we got away with all that. And we would dig and dig. Of course, we never found anything. <laughs> but, we, but we spent a lot of time doing that sort of thing. We, you just came up with your own ideas, you know. But as far as having a lot of toys, we didn't. But we, we made uh, tree houses. We'd climb a tree and put boards up on it and climb up and we didn't really have a house but we would put a couple of boards up there and make out like we did. Or we would do another thing, we would cut off palmetto, big uh, palmetto palms, you know, and we would put them around some trees and we would have our little house. And that's the kind of thing that we did growing up. But as far as having a lot of toys or anything, we didn't. We didn't do that. Not like today. And of course there was no TV. Of course. And you listen to the radio at night. That's the only time you listen to it. Do you remember any radio shows? Yes. Uh, the Lone Ranger. Every We always listened to The Lone Ranger. And uh, something else came on. Uh, Cowboy Show came on another one. I uh, can't think of the name of that one. Trigger. Who was head to horse named Trigger? Uh, Anyway, we, we did listen to those kind of stuff. And then uh, Grand Ole Opry came on every Saturday night. We listened to that. Uh, but And everybody just sat around the radio. It was quiet, and you listened to it. Who were your childhood friends? Uh, some of the, the same people that I started out with in the first grade. I, they were still with me when I graduated. <laughs> And I don't know how many people were in the first grade, but probably 20 or so. And uh, when I graduated, there were nine. But most of them I had started out with in the first grade. And uh, some, a couple of them lived close to me, and we would go to each other's house and play. But, or actually, a lot of times we went to the school ground and played. They had swing sets there. And uh, they had a field, play baseball on and all that. And, and then another thing, we had a cow and to get for milk. And every day my daddy would take that cow with a chain on it and go across the road to the school grounds, <laughs> which had some woods on it, a little bit of woods. And he would stake the cow out there, on, and the cow would eat the grass on the school ground. And then we'd bring it in every night. And there was, nobody thought anything was wrong with that. That was just what you did. And it's crazy. Things change so much. But today you couldn't think about doing something like that. <laughs> Another thing that we would do when we got a little bit older, uh, where the school is, the railroad track ran right behind the school. And we would be watching a ball game on Sunday afternoon, which everybody in town went. And there would be just a bunch of people get up a game, you know, choose up men, and they would play baseball, and everybody would be there to watch it. And these boys would figure out how to let some of the air out of the tires on their car and get it on the railroad track. And they would, we would be sitting here watching the ball game and way out there past the field, there goes the car down the railroad track. And that was the highlight of the day. Of the day. <laughs> I don't know how they did that. Sometimes they'd get off and go bump, 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 bump down there too. <laughs> did you have any other animals besides the milk cow? Oh yeah, well we had, uh, we had a dog. I had two dogs, I'll never forget. Uh, the first one we got, 
Oh, we, we, we got this white Spitz, and we had that dog for 14 years. His name was Troubles. And uh, he, he was just a lifelong pet. And uh, then one time, my daddy brought home a little black puppy uh, when he was working with, for Nelson and Company, which is Wheeler's. Uh, he was a, a man who checked uh, the fruit. He was a fruit tester. And when they would go to pick oranges in the groves, he had all this equipment and he would uh, slice the fruit and put the juice in and he knew how to measure it to see how much solid it had, how much sugar it had. They had to do that when they picked the oranges to know what kind of thing it was. Anyway, while he was, was gone one day, somebody gave him that little puppy. He brought it home. And we already had that other dog, and my mother said, and I thought it was my dog. It was my dog. Uh, I called her Black Beauty, because I had just read that book, Black Beauty. And I had that dog for a couple of weeks. My mother kept saying all the time, you can't keep that dog. You can't keep that dog. Well, I kept it two or three months. And one day I came home from school, and the dog wasn't there. And my mother had given it to somebody who was walking by and saw it, and she asked them if they wanted that dog. See, we couldn't have two dogs. You gave my dog away. And I was very, very heartbroken about that. <laughs> but um, anyway, we knew who had it. We used to go down and see the dog all the time. But that was that one of the only pets that we ever had was those two dogs. And the cow, of course. It went, that was it. How many siblings do you have? I had uh, I had two sisters and two brothers. And I still have one sister and one brother. The others are all passed away. And how did you get along with your siblings? Good. Well, there was a big uh, there was 7 years difference between my older my older sister who's here and uh I had a, my oldest sister was 10 years older than me, and then Catherine was next to her, and then I had a brother who was seven years older, and then there was me, and then my younger brother, who's two years younger, who still lives in Oviedo. And uh, so we were, uh, my sister will be the first to tell you that me and my brother were spoiled because we were younger, then there was seven years difference, and by the time we came along, we didn't have to do all the work that they had to do, and she says, we got by with a lot of stuff, which not true, <laughs> but because uh, they grew up and they left home, we were still at home, you know, for seven more years, but uh, many, today she lives close to me now. She used to live in Orlando for most all her life, and now she lives here. What did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, I wanted to be uh, a teacher, and I wanted to teach English and literature, which I loved, and a PE. And the reason I wanted to teach PE, one reason, because I loved sports and all that. We used to have these girls in our PE class which we would go at with different times of the year, you did different things. We had basketball. We actually didn't have a lot of sports, but we played basketball and softball. Those were the only two sports that girls played. And, uh, but those girls, so many of them were lazy. And they would just say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm having my period and I can't play. And so they'd sit in the gym, you know, and just sit there and not do anything. And that wasn't true. They're just lazy. And I always said, one day I'm going to be a PE teacher and nobody's going to be sitting in there on the bench because I'm going to give them a trash can and they're going to walk around the schoolyard and pick up the trash if they can't do anything else. That was my goal. But I didn't get to do any of those things because <laughs> I didn't get to go to college as much as I wanted to. Uh, but uh, it all turned out okay anyway. But that's I loved school. I love school. I would go to school as soon as I was old enough to be able to do this. The teachers always came to school in those days. Two weeks before school, the teachers would be at school getting their classrooms ready. And they always stayed for two weeks after school was out. And I would go to school and find my teacher that I was going to have 
and I would ask her what I could do to help her, and I would stay there because I just loved going to school. I was always not happy when school was out every year. I loved school. What you mentioned, you wanted to be a, a English teacher. What were some of your favorite books? Oh, gee. Uh, I remember Heidi when I was little. Heidi, you know, if you ever read that book. And, uh, and then, uh, oh, after I got older, I remember books I read, but I can't think of any right off the... Oh, I'll never forget. I'm going to tell you a funny story about this book. We had this little book that somebody gave us on the life of Abraham Lincoln. And it was a child's book. You know, it had pictures of Lincoln, and it was written so a child could understand. Well, you know when you get up in the high school, you've got to write a book report. You've got to read a book every six weeks. Well, we did then. And you've got to about write a book report on it and turn it in. Well, we had this book. I didn't do this, but my brothers did. They got the Abraham Lincoln book, which you could read in 15 minutes if you were an adult, you know. And they would almost copy it word for word and turn that thing in for a book report and got by with it. But I, <laughs> I always remember that. But I used to, uh, uh, we had in Oviedo, actually, they had, uh, we had the drugstore, which was the place, the number one place in Oviedo was the drugstore. They also had a section down there where they had like library books, new books that were written today and uh, modern books. And you could go check them out. And uh, I would go down there and check the books out there. And I had a teacher, uh, uh, her name was Miss Walker, and uh, she got married later, her name was Miss Anderson. But she told me about these books, and she would recommend a book for me to read. And I would go down to the drugstore and check it out and read those books. And then after I got married and had kids, it hardly had time to read, but every day when they took a nap after lunch, I would. I was a member of the book club, and I would read my. I'm still reading today. Uh, in an earlier conversation, you mentioned your mother was a seamstress. Yes. Can you elaborate on some of the things? You yes, uh, my mother uh, was. Uh, she she packed oranges for 25 years for Nelson and Company. I remember that well because we used to go down there sometime after. So we'd have to go down there and see her about something. But, uh, but she also was a seamstress. And she learned to do this on her own. My mother came to Oviedo on the train from Sanford. She only got to go to school to the eighth grade, and she loved school. That was another thing. She lived over here in Sanford. And she came out there to operate the telephone service, the, be the telephone operator. And uh, that's where she met my father. But um, I don't know when or how she learned to sew because I know that she was young, uh, maybe 16, 17 years old then when she came out there. And uh, I never heard about her mother sewing, so I, I, I didn't know how she ever learned, but she was very good. She made all our clothes, never had a bought dress, never had anything bought until one day she did get me a big coat. I have a picture. It's in one of my books that it was a really a store-bought coat. It looked like fur. It wasn't, but it was. And I, I, there's a picture of me in that book in school, standing there with that big old coat on. <laughs> but she made, uh, she made all my clothes. And, uh, and my, my sisters, too. And she made, she sewed for other people. They would come to the house, and uh, she made clothes for them, too. But she made me uh, something I'll never forget. She made a red coat. It was like a red wool coat, bright red, and in the inside was satin lined. It was fully, you know, like a, I was only about 10 years old. And I thought that was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. And I wanted to wear it to school. But she said, no, that was to wear to church. You know, that was special. I finally remember I got to wear it to school, but I never forgot that. And to this day, not too long ago, I learned the song, 
that Dolly Parton wrote, My Coat of Many Colors. I don't know if you've ever heard familiar with that. Anyway, it always made me, we weren't that hard up. It wasn't made out of rags like her coat was. But every time I learn that song, I think about my red coat that my mother made me. So that, uh, and she sewed everything. And then what happened years later, I always said, every night my mother would sit there by the sewing machine to sew. And we'd be sitting listening to radio. And she would sew till late. And I said, there's one thing I'm never going to do. I am never going to sew. Because I thought it was just too much work. Well, got married. My husband gives me a sewing machine for Christmas, plus lessons over in Orlando. That's why I go take lessons. And so I did that. And lo and behold, I liked it. And I could make my I made my kids' clothes. And I have pictures, Easter pictures, where everybody's even my little boys' coats. We all had dresses of just alike. And we all had hats and gloves, and we would go to church. And I mean, some of them are little kids, and we got movies of all this. And we would go to church, and then, especially on Easter and Mother's Day, we went to Morrison's Cafeteria after church, the only time we ever went out to eat. And we would go there, and then we would go to Lake Eola in Orlando to the Easter parade and go up on the platform at, at Lake Eola and walk across there with our Easter outfits on. And the last thing I made was uh, my daughter, one of my daughters got married and I made her uh, all the dresses for that. And it was like a Southern Belle type thing. And the wedding was here in our yard. And uh, I made all the dresses for that. But I haven't, and I made my kids a little, but they had a band uh, that they played. They had guitars and all that. And we had all of them played, but then the, the four younger ones were playing in a little group. They started out doing it for school, and it got they got good. And we played it at, for Doctor's Day, for Fourth of July. So I made them outfits alike, you know, vest-like things to wear for that. And that, I really enjoyed being able to do all that. It was neat. Um, in an earlier conversation, you mentioned several different houses you've moved to mm -hmm. throughout the years. Uh, could you describe them? Yes. The first house we lived in, it was called the West House because Ms. West owned it, was the one that was across from the school. And then we moved. I'll never forget that because we didn't have electricity in that house. We had lanterns, like oil lanterns. And uh, then I remember when we moved, and my mother was so excited because that the house we moved in is still there. And uh, it's you go by the Lawton House and go on down through that red line up the hill, and it's it's on the left. It sits up on top of that hill there. Still, it's funny. It doesn't look near as big as it did when I was growing up. Everything looks smaller. But uh, we moved in that house, and electricity, running water. We had the house we lived in had a pump outside. You pump the water and brought it in before. Now we had water. You turn the faucet on, you could take a bath in the bathtub. That was a big thing for us. That was our first time to do that. And uh, so that was, we really liked that house. And my mother wanted to buy it. We, did, we were renting. And uh, the lady sold it to somebody else, so we didn't get to buy. So we, we had to move. So we moved down back into town into an area that, the house is not there today because it's the parking lot of the First Baptist Church where the house was. It was real small, but then there were only all my brothers and sisters, the older ones, just me and my little brother were still home, so it was okay because he just needed... And we actually slept on this sleeping porch, bunk beds. He, I slept on top and he slept down the bottom. And then later when I got a little older, they moved me into the dining room and they opened the couch up every night and slept on it. <laughs> But uh, that's where we lived until I left home. And, and then after my mother got sick, she had a, a Parkinson. And she stayed there as long as she could. And a very independent person. Very. Always wanted to take care of everything herself. Never wanted any charity from anybody. Very independent. And uh, so uh, she was in the, nur in the nursing home in, Orlando, in Winter Park. And, and then eventually she ran out of money. 
and she had to stay there because she could, and still had her house. And uh, she she took the money and sold the house and used it to pay her hospital bill until. Were there any community events that you would attend regularly? Uh, actually, very few um, community events. Most everything centered around either school or church. And uh, that was the activities for, and the other thing though, in the summertime, very important, the swimming pool. Ovita had a pool, no, Sanford didn't have one, Longwood didn't have one, and there weren't any in, in people's homes in those days. They didn't do that. But there, Oviedo had a swimming pool, a good, big record size pool. And then they had a baby pool next to it. Everybody came from Sanford and everything out there. My daddy ran the pool. And so every day in the summertime, we'd go to the pool. Every day after lunch, you'd go to the pool. And then also, they had a dance floor and an old juk, juk organ, you know, and uh, so that was a very popular place that people went in the summertime. You'd go all the time. And uh, that was very important part of our life in those days. That and actually we didn't do much else. We rode our bikes a lot. That we did. Uh, walked everywhere. We didn't have a car. In fact, most, a lot of people didn't. Uh, and at a school, there would be three maybe kids that drove a car to school when they got in high school. The other cars belonged to the teachers. And these boys usually were from Slavia, and the reason they got to do that was so that as soon as school was out, they could go home and start working out in the farms there. But, uh, and you walked everywhere. We walked all the way from our house down to the pool. And the, the crazy part was, and we'd do it at night. I would be, 15 years old and I'd be walking home with another friend and she lived somewhere else and she'd go to her house and I'd we walk all the way home in the dark at 10 o'clock at night nobody thought anything about it today you wouldn't do that at all I wouldn't think of letting my kids to do that but in those days it was not a problem and you didn't lock your door at our house if you mama did decide to lock the door the windows that went from the porch into the <laughs> to the living room. All you had to do was raise it up and go in. I mean, if anybody could. There wasn't. No one broke in the houses. There was not any of that. You hardly ever heard of anybody stealing anything. That didn't happen in those days. You just didn't have what we have today. Uh, it is so different. Everybody took care of everybody else. Uh, but as far as uh, entertainment and all, we rode our bikes to Lake Charm. That was a big thing. Get on your bike and ride from Ovita out to Lake Charm. You know where that is. And ride around the lake. That was what we did. My brother would catch fish. And he'd sell it to the people that he went by their homes on the way home. He'd stop and sell his fish to them. Yeah. As I understand, you attended the First Baptist Church of Oviedo. Right. Um, what are some memories of services or events? Uh, they had, uh, uh, like when you were real little, they had what they call sunbeam band. When you were little, I remember going to that, sitting in the little red chairs and learning uh, Little songs that I've never forgot, I could sing them for you to this day, and they learned them in Sunbeam Band. And then, as you got older, they had a, a girls organization, organization called GAs, Girls Auxiliary or something, and, and that was extra. That you, So it gave you something else to go to, and you learned all kinds of scripture verses, and you learned so much, and then you got promoted up to another level, and all of that. And the boys had something called RAs, Royal Ambassadors, and they did that. And uh, you had uh, a Christmas program, and uh, that was always a big thing every year, the Christmas program in our church. And you went to church uh, every Sunday morning and it's Sunday night. And that was what all the teenagers did. And then, uh, I'll never forget this, uh, 
One, my mother always would say, come straight home from church. This was where we lived, right, we lived next to the church almost, one little block of the church. And this was, I was a senior in high school. And uh, this particular night, and my friend, girlfriend lived right down the street from me. And these two boys asked us if we wanted to go for a ride. And uh, I didn't particularly want to go with this guy, but I knew she did. So I was going to help her out. And we said, okay. And I knew I was supposed to go home, but I didn't. So we got in the car with them. We went from Obita out to Slavia, if you know where that is. Turned down a little dirt road that's now right where the uh, nursing home is out there. Down there was a dirt road that went down there and got down there and this guy's going to park. And I said, nope. I said, I want to go home. So he was not happy. We had the self couples in the back seat. So he takes off and we tears down the road and we get to the hard road, the road that goes to Winter Park today. And he is that he's going too fast. And he turns and rolls the car, rolled it over two or three times. I went through the windshield and landed on the, on the railroad track. The railroad track went by there. And the car, I look, and I'm all right. The car is upside down. The wheels are still going around. The lights are on. We had a friend that lived right down the road from there. They heard it, and they came up. And uh, But in the meantime, a car with a lady in it from Ovita came driving by. She saw the accident. And you know, it scared them because they didn't know where I wasn't in the car. They thought maybe I was under the car, but I wasn't. But the, I, I lost my shoe, one of my shoes, couldn't find it. But anyway, this lady knew me, knew my parents, and she said, I'll take you home. And this was about 10 o'clock at night. So I had to go home and go in there and wake up my parents. They were already asleep. With one, the whole thing that was bothering me was the fact that I lost my shoe and couldn't find it. But I didn't have but one pair of loafers, you know, and I had to wear them to school the next day. What am I going to wear to school? Anyway, I had to tell her we, that that happened. I'll, I'll never forget. It told the, the car, told, it totaled that messed it all up. And the, the guy who was driving his, nobody got hurt, really, luckily. I did have to go in a couple, I got dizzy in a couple of days, and I had to go over and get x-rayed, and I had a slight concussion. But that was never any more to that and uh, but anyway I felt sorry for the boy that was driving the car because his mother was pregnant and they were she had to have that car to go to the doctor in Sanford so he was in big trouble that was a memory I'll remember well <laughs> anyway in a prior conversation you mentioned the town's doctor could you tell me any stories you have of him? The town doctor? Dr. Martin, yes. Dr. Martin was the town, and he did everything. He pulled teeth, and, you know, anybody got anything wrong with him. What you hardly ever, I, re, I don't remember going to him, uh, it, but just one time, uh, my mother, I came, we came in from somewhere one time, and my daddy was washing dishes. And that was unheard of because I had never seen him wash a dish in my life or do anything in the kitchen. And he was washing dishes and I said, what is going on? And I was a teenager. And uh, it, my, my mother had been doing it and there was a knife in the water and she had cut her hand real bad. And he had to take her over to Dr. Martin and get it sewed up. And I remember that. And then another thing that happened, uh, Dr. Martin and his wife, Mrs. Martin, were very active in our church. Ms. Martin taught Sunday school and all that. They, this doctor's office was right next to the church, a little bit behind it, right next to it. And they had a bell out there by the office. Doctors, the office was right by the home. And if somebody came while the doctor was in church, they would ring the bell. And he would hear it, get up and go out of church and go. One Sunday that happened. Somebody had done something to their leg, was laying on the back of a truck with no sides on it, just a wooden back. And he goes over to take care of it, and he took that guy's leg off, the rest of it. 
while everybody, who, of course, when, as soon as we could get out of church, we all went running over to see what's going on. And they're all standing around watching Dr. Martin take saw this guy's leg off while he's laying on the back of the truck. <laughs> yeah, he was a character. Yeah. And also, uh, in an earlier conversation uh, about school, you mentioned the disciplinary actions of certain teachers. Yes. What are some experiences that stuck out to you? Uh, well, I'm not going to tell you that story I told you last time because I don't want to get in trouble about that one. But uh, uh, most of my teachers, uh, it, I've always said this, and I'm prob you probably know this, but everybody does. You always have certain teachers that are really good teachers, and you'll never forget them. I mean, they, I, have, I can remember certain teachers that were just good, and then there are some that you wonder why they're doing this, you know. Uh, but uh, I, we had this one teacher, and <clears throat> uh, she was hard to get along with. She, was, she never had a smile on her face. She was just real sharp, and it's always getting on everybody for every little thing. And she taught the fourth grade, and I was getting older by then. Because all the grades, one through 12, went to the same school. You walk down the hall, and, and this was something I was I was bad sometimes at school. I must have been seventh grade because junior high is really the bad time. <laughs> if you can look at my, I have every report card, and I could you can pick out the ones I had when I was in seventh and eighth grade. Uh, and anyway, she was just always mean to the kids. I thought, and so she left her door open, she'd be in there talking and you could walk down the hall and you could hear her and see her in there. So one day when we were kid talking out there on the, before you walk into the main building on the porch, and uh, so I said, there was a box, an old cardboard box laying there. I said, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk down the hall and we'll throw it in a room, see what happens. So they bet me I wouldn't do it. So I did it. I walked in, I threw it in there and ran on down the hall. She caught me. And she took me up to the office, and the principal there knew me, of course, and he knew that she also, that she was a little bit difficult to get along with. And all he did to me was, after she left, he said he'd take care of it, and uh, he gave me a poem to learn. He says, now you just sit here and learn this poem, and don't do that anymore. <laughs> but we had some, uh, we had another teacher who had been there for many years and taught my older, you know, that was another thing. The teachers you got, they had already had your older sister who was a brain. You know, you're supposed to know as much as she did. And uh, they always compared you as you went down, the, the kids. But uh, we had this teacher and she could be, she was a good teacher, but she, she didn't really, I don't think she had children of her own. I never think she never had children. but. She would do things that uh, would hurt people. Like we had this one girl that lived across the railroad track. Her home was over there, and she walked to school across the railroad track. Nicest person in the world. And one day, she did something, and this, this teacher criticized her so badly in front of the whole class, and the girl did not deserve it. She didn't do anything. Oh, she was a little bit late, I think. And I think she was late because the train was across the track. And she got all over her for being late to class and made the girl cry. And she did that to another girl in my class. And I just, it just really, I never ever forgot it. Even though she was a good teacher, she, she would ridicule students sometimes. And, uh, and I thought that, and, and it was embarrassing for that student in front of all the other kids. Uh, so you just remember certain people for certain things. But most of my teachers were good. But oh, I gotta tell you one more school story. Right next to the school lived, uh, there were some houses. And one of these houses was Mr. McCulley's house and Charlie McCulley was my I went to school first grade through 12 I wish I knew if he was still living today I would love to see him uh, but anyway they had chickens chicken yard 
And one night, uh, some of the high school boys got Mr. McCulley's chickens, three or four, and brought them over. And for some reason, we were able to get in and out of the school. I don't know what it was, but they knew how to open, pick the lock or something and go in there. And so they got these chickens, and we had this teacher that was a retired military. His name was Mr. Baden. And Mr. Baden was vague. He shouldn't have been teaching history. I mean, he was like, he didn't even know the subject, you know, and, and he didn't, do, nobody cared for him, but he was just kind of dumb. And so they put these chickens in his room and shut the door and left them in there all night. <laughs> The next day he came to school and had all those chickens in there. And another time they took somebody's old Model T and put it in the hall. Put it in the hall. And every Halloween they put a metal trash can on top of the flagpole, upside down. Nobody ever figured out how they did it, but they, that was, you knew it would be there the next morning. <laughs> another thing though, when I went to school, what we did every day, they, they had the flag, it stayed in the office, and they had certain people that did this. And they would take the flag out, unfold it, put it on the flagpole, and put the flag up. And that was, and if it rained, you ran out there and you took the flag down. You never let the flag stay up during the rain, you never let it stay up overnight. That was the way it was, always, the whole time I was in school it was that way. We always had what we call chapel every every Friday morning. Everybody in the school went to the auditorium, and there was a program. And a lot of once a month, you had a pastor of one of the churches came and talked, and it'd be a different one each time. And today, that could never happen. You always had the Pledge of Allegiance every morning before class. And you always said the Lord's Prayer. You did those times the whole time I was in school. Now things have changed. I have read that uh, Oviedo High did not become integrated until the 1960s. Growing up during segregation, do you recall any incidences where you recognized the separation of race? Oh, when I was growing up, I remember when integration started because we were living here. And I had kids in school, and I remember the first day uh, that it that the schools were integrated. And my kids were in high school at that time, but back when when I was growing up, it, everything was segregated. Blacks were, wrote if they got on the bus, they had to write on uh, like the, we had a bus that came from Orlando to Oviedo. It was called Orlando Transit, and if you got on the bus, all the black people had to sit in the back. They loaded back to front. But this was another thing. They did have buses that went went out to get kids to go to my school. The blacks didn't have a bus. They they had to walk to school. And they lived past where I lived up on the hill. There were what we call the Negro quarters. They were called the quarters. They lived a lot of there were different places, but there was a group down there. They walked by our house and they had to walk all the way across town to the black school. And of course there was there was no no integration at all. And uh, it even uh, it was just unheard of for uh, for people to, to mix up or, or even they was just two separate entities. And uh, it gradually it got better. I remember like when my daughter who uh, just passed away this last summer, when she was a senior in high school, she was yearbook editor, just like I was yearbook editor when I was school. And uh, but uh, and the two years before that we had integration. It started when my oldest son was in sc still in school. And uh, so there were some black on her uh, editor on her uh, staff to do the yearbook and when they got ready to have the, the party there was a big discussion about whose house they could have it at because that meant black people kids were going to come 
the same way with my daughter, a younger daughter, Julie, who's a nurse uh, now. Uh, when she was a cheerleader, uh, we had some black girls and they were cheerleaders with her. And uh, a lot of people, it was hard for a lot of people to get used to that. They didn't like it. And But I remember I took them because uh, the parents, the white girls' parents worked too. I was a stay-at-home mom. And uh, all the other parents of the cheerleaders worked. And, and so they never went to anything. And they never, the cheerleaders needed to go to cheerleading camp. I drove them over there and picked them up. I made their uniforms. And, and I took the black girls too, you know. And somebody would say, are you going to do that? I said, yes. And I can remember that. And then I remember when my oldest daughter, the one that was a yearbook editor, went to Miami. She trained at uh, Jackson Moral School of Nursing for nursing. And she had to watch a uh, autopsy. They, they had this group. They watched her up, up looking down through this glass to watch it. And that was part of her nurse's training. And it was a black girl they were doing an autopsy on. And she said, you know, Mom, when you open up somebody, they're the same on the inside as you are. And she said, a lot of people need to think about that. And, you know, and that was just what she figured out on her own. I said, that's, that's right. And right now, two or three doors down here, my best friend is a black girl who's 50 years old, who was married to a white man who just passed away. And she and I walk every two days a week. And we have a ball. She is more fun. And anyway, uh, that is certainly not a problem today. But I remember when it was a very big problem. I can remember when the guy who was the the the, the, the constable or the police chief in Oviedo, the only only one policeman. I can remember how he mistreated black people that he put in jail. He hit him. He had a billy stick, and I remember hearing how he hit him in the head with that, and, you know, I mean, they were mistreated. They were bad. It was bad. I can remember some bad things that happened. I'm certainly glad that part is over. Now, hopefully it's over. What year did you graduate at Oviedo High School, and what was the graduation ceremony like? Uh, 1951. Nine people in my graduating class. In those days, you always had a a baccalaureate service. I don't know if they still don't still do that, but they always had a uh, uh, and they had it at the school. It was just like a graduation thing, but you had it like on uh, two or three days before graduation. You had baccalaureate, and they would like preach a sermon, or they would do a. It would be a talk on how you, to live your life and all that sort of thing. But it was a different, and every year they'd have a different path. We had a Methodist and a Baptist and the Lutheran Church. Those were the three main churches. And they would take turns uh, doing the baccalaureate service. So you always had that first. And then you had graduation. And at the same time, a graduate graduation night you also they gave out any awards that now now today I know my kids they have an award night for different things but in the, they did all the awards the night of graduation and uh, I got I never forget this because my older sister got a bunch so when I came along I did too except one she got one that I didn't get and my mother said, as soon as she walked out of that thing, the first thing she said was, how come you didn't get, I forgot what it was, American Legion Award or something. I said, that's all right. I got Best All-Round Athlete Award. My sister didn't get that. <laughs> but I got the History Award and, uh, and the uh, Leadership Award. Uh, I forgot what it's another name for it. But uh, I never forget that. She, no, how come I didn't get that one? So, but back, we had awards night the same night as we did that. You know.
that was about it. And where did your life take you after high school? Uh, not very far. My whole thing was to leave Oviedo. Both of my sisters had left and went to work at a bank in Orlando. Uh, my older sister went first and she got, she worked at Florida State, it was called Florida State Bank then, in downtown Orlando, right down in the middle of town. And then when my sister graduated, my old, other sister had talked to him and got her in, the, she worked in the bookkeeping department, so they both went to Orlando to work in the bank. Well, I didn't want to work at the bank. What I wanted to do was go to college, and I did not get to go. And Mr. Lawton, T.W. Lawton, you've heard of the Lawtons, uh, he was a cousin of ours, and uh, he knew how much I wanted to go. And uh, so I was supposed to go over to, with him, right, because he, he drove to Sanford every, uh, every day to work at the, down at the courthouses where his office was. And uh, they were going to have the tests for scholarships. You could take this test to try to get a scholarship to go to FSU. In those days, it was a woman's college. And uh, so I was all set to go. My principal had fixed it for me to go because I was valedictorian. And, and I was kind of smart and then thought I could pass, get maybe, maybe get a scholarship. And I was going to go. And Mr. Law, and I was, had already made arrangements with him. I didn't tell my mother anything about it. Because she had said, we can't afford to send you to college. You know, we don't have money to do that. And, but so I thought, if I can get a scholarship, you know what can do this. And uh, so, doggone if, if uh, Mr., Somebody from one of the teachers called, and my mother answered the phone, and she said, well, tell Betty when she goes tomorrow to take the scholarship test. She didn't know I was going. I didn't tell her. And, uh, but Mr. Lawton knew, because I had already contacted him. He was going to take me. And so she says, what is this all about? And I told her, she said, we can't do that. So she called Mr. Lawton and told him not to come, not to pick me up, because I couldn't. Even if I got it, it was just they couldn't afford all the stuff they still have to do for me to go. And he called back and he said, "Listen, I will help her go. I will help her financially if you will." But my mother would never take any money from anybody, so that I did not get to do. But, so then, I get on the bus after I get out of school. And I, the, 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 my senior year, I worked for Mr. Teague, was the principal. I worked in the office half a day every day because I had had all the subjects they had. I took, I didn't stud, I have a study hall. I took a subject. So there wasn't any subjects left for me to take. So he asked me to be the school secretary, work in the office, Half, half a day, and I did that all that senior year. And, so, and then after I graduate, I'm, I'm going to Orlando riding the bus trying to walk around find a job, which I hadn't found. I come home one day and my mother says, well, you got a job, I got you a job. Mr. T called and wanted to know if you want a full-time job being a school secretary. So, oh, geez, I wanted to leave. I wanted to get out of Oviedo and go do something different. So I was home for a year. And then I got married and moved to Sanford. And then I uh, was married for three years. I had We built a house. City of Sanford would give you a lot, give you a lot, but you had to build a house within a year. We built a house. We cleared the lot. I can show you that house today. We built a house. I mean, laid the blocks, poured the floor, did the whole thing. In one year, he worked for the railroad, and we did this when he wasn't working, we built the house. I laid block, all that stuff. And we were able to move in within a year. It wasn't finished, but we moved in. And uh, anyway, he was, uh, I had two kids. And when I had a year old baby and a three year old son, and he was killed uh, in a train accident. He was a railroader, train accident. Uh, and then I met my husband I have today, uh, eight months later, which everybody thought was too soon, but at church, 
and uh, we've been married. We we just celebrated uh, Monday our 58th wedding anniversary. So it worked. <laughs> and we had four more kids. That six. After your first husband died for those eight months before you met yeah. your, how did you survive? Uh, well, uh, Social Security, uh, uh, and he had some insurance. And uh, the other thing, though, we had done, we had bought, borrowed money and had borrowed, uh, I think it was $4,000. Bought 80 acres now, 80 acres in Osteen. Uh, down a road that if you took it, took it all the way to Oak Hill, it was a back road that goes through there. We bought 80 acres and we got these cows from the dairy and we were, we were raising cows out there. We were doing that too. So when he died, I had the 80 acres and about seven or eight cow of calves and I had to go feed them on a nipple bucket. And I was going out there every day doing, in fact, that's where I was when they came out and found me to tell me what had happened. And, uh, so anyway, uh, I had that when I married Don, and he was in a TV business. And uh, so we, he went out there and got some more cows and played cowboy. <laughs> and we had that, and we eventually were able to sell it for 16000 which when those, that was a long time ago, back in there, we're talking about the 60s. And, uh, and we bought another five bought 10 acres out here near the airport and put our cows out there and had that. And then we had a chance to buy this place. And uh, we lived in town and he, he had a really nice big house. We, moved, we sold my house there and moved into his house. And, uh, but we had a pool. We added on the house three times. We had a bunch of kids. We had to keep adding on to the house. And we had a pool, which was new at those times. Not too many people had them. So every day, I had not just my kids, I had everybody in the neighborhood's kids at my house. And it got to be a zoo. I said, we got to move. So he was out here fixing these people's tele television set, and he saw this place, he said. And they wanted, there was an old couple, they wanted to move into town. Well, we owned another house across the street that was a rental. And uh, so they, we almost swapped them. And of course, they had to work on this for a year to make it so we could. This this uh, this was outside the house. This wall was the outside, and that brick and that fireplace. There was a fireplace was right here. We chipped all the brick out of that. That's the same brick that were in the fireplace, and we added this room, and we added another bathroom, and put what was a porch. We made that into bigger bedrooms, and we moved out here with six kids. And uh, it's been a great, great place to live. And then we got a lot of, I'll show you my studio before you go, this outside. And how did you meet your, how did you meet Don, your second husband? My husband now? It, uh, it was a put up job. <laughs> it really was. Uh, he, he came here in the Navy and uh, he was, he got married and he was married and he was divorced when I met him. Uh, and he was at the church anyway one day after my husband had passed away I called and I had the two little kids and I was still I was going to church down there but and I had gone to church all my life but I was saying you know I told him I, I was just kind of down and I called the, the church and they sent the assistant pastor came out and I told him, I said I'm going to church but I'm not getting anything out of it I said I'm just not I was miserable and he said you know what you need to be you don't need to be sitting in a class you know, with your kids in there, you need to be teaching class. So he said, we have seven-year-olds, we need a teacher for seven-year-olds. Would you, and so I did, he said, okay. So I go first Sunday, I go in this, we had 30-something seven-year-olds and there were four or five teachers. He was a teacher, Don was teaching Sunday school with seven-year-olds. They put us both in the same room with a little thing in between. And it didn't take very long. And uh, so, we got that's where I met him. Was there? We've been together ever since. What are some fond memories you have of raising your children? Oh, great memories! And the good part about it was we had a movie camera, took movies of everything we did, 
every Christmas, every Thanksgiving, every birthday, all events. Oh, you should see our kids going to Lake Eola, lined up where the flowers are, with all the little kids with all, all the little girls had white gloves on, hats, frilly dresses, boys had on ties and coats and, and uh, getting in and out of the cars, going to church. Uh, it's watching them trying to get in and out of the cars and all that. And, uh, and then going on vacations, camping, that was the only way you could go take that many kids anywhere on vacation is to go camping. And that's what we did. We went camping. We started out in Florida, ended up in the mountains. And they still go camping to this day. But, uh, and then I, I enjoyed my kids. Uh, I never missed a, any program that they were in. And uh, of course, when you got that many, they're in different things, you know. Uh, and, and this one daughter, she tickled me because if I was going to have to come to school for, uh, drive a car for, uh, you know, take the kids somewhere, trip or something, she would tell me, pick out what she wanted me to wear. She wanted you to look good, you know. <laughs> she would come in there and she said, Mom, this is what I want you to wear. <laughs> but uh, I really, and I never missed a PTA meeting. And I remember going, and I have two or three kids in one school, and you went to each one of them's class, and I'm trying to go to all of them's class, change classes, and do this, but I always did, kept up with what was going on, and uh, and they all did good in school, pretty good in school, and never really had any major problems with them. Uh, all did school, all all graduated good, and uh, have great memories, and then I had all these. And there used to be, the, the movies were on film. And then, till now, you know, now it's entirely different. But my daughter, uh, that the one that we went to her house, she took those. And I don't know how long it took her. She's finally still got something to do. And put them all on DVDs. And, uh, and we have them all today. And a lot of nights when we don't have anything on TV we want to watch, we sit and watch the kids all growing when they were little, all the way up. So that, we have those, and I, I tell them today, I said, y'all, all these things on your camera, now you need to be making sure you, you, you have these things, don't just let it get taken off of there, because we have a record of everything, and y'all aren't gonna have it. Oh no, I'm just gonna let that go. I understand that your great grandfather Andrew Allen founded Oviedo. Right. What are some stories about him or other founding families like the Lawtons or Wheelers that you remember being uh, told? Well, he passed away before I was born, and uh, the uh, the way that uh, he came down here, a lot of those people that were he was Swedish came over here from Sweden. And he didn't come the way so many people in this area did. The Sanford area is all a lot of Swedes over here, and they came over uh, to work the citrus groves. And the and the people that owned the groves here would pay their way on the ship if they'd come and work a year. That's how a lot of them came. But he didn't come that way. He came in up at uh, on the East Coast in New York or somewhere like that, and he came down through Georgia and then eventually ended down here. And um, he, uh, uh, at first Oviedo, the settlement was out on uh, Lake Jessup. And they call it White's Wharf was the name of it, little settlement. And then they sort, sort of moved into, o, into what is to Oviedo today. And uh, he was one of them that moved in there and became the, he was the first postmaster. And they had to come up with a name. And uh, he was the one that named it. And he is also a school teacher and he spoke about four or five languages. He was very smart. And the reason he named it, oh, it should be pronounced Oviedo, was he traveled uh, before he came over here. And then he even went back over to Europe several times. And he had been to Oviedo, Spain. And he thought since Florida was a Spanish word, he thought we'd name it Oviedo, and he called it Oviedo. And at uh, one time, 
it, it was it was in Orange County. You know, that used to be all Orange County out this part of this place was too. And and it was uh so then he, and he opened a store. He had a store there also. And they and I've heard of, of different things people written about him and said that they'd go in their store and he'd be so intent on reading something. He was very intellectual and he liked to read all the time that they'd have to w make him quit reading to wait on him because he was into that. And when he passed away, he didn't have a lot of money, but what he had, he gave to Rollins College. He was just starting and he was one of the people that gave what he had to Rollins College because he wanted to see that college be there. So he was I wish I had known him. He was I was he was gone before I came along. And his wife was a Lawton. So that's how we got involved with that. And uh then it's it's crazy because when we started going through different history things, I found out that in the Lees and Oveda, which are, that's all involved, the Lawton's Lees and Oveda's, all the sisters all married those people. They were sisters, and one married a Lawton, one married a Lee, and a Wheeler, and all that. And uh, so, when my on my mother's side, who came from Sanford, there were some Lees. Her sister's married to Lees, and and I all all I asked a couple of times. I said, "Y'all and Ken to Lees and Ovita?" No, no. Well, they are. Uh, so they got this book on the Jacobs family, and I started reading it. And the Jacobs family involved with both Lees there, Lees here. So way back, if you wanted to go by marriage things, my mother was actually her people were ancestors with my father's people way back and by marriage and I thought I just found that out not too long ago and I bet that they I've got to tell them they don't know it <laughs> but that was uh and the, the another thing when when my husband my first husband he was Catholic and uh, when we when he went and talked to my daddy about us getting married he said well there's one thing I want you to do I don't care which church you go to, but both of you go to the same one because, and Ovita's known for that, the Lawtons and the Wheelers and the, the Wheel, Frank Wheeler, big in the Baptist church, his wife was big in the Methodist church. Same thing with the Lawtons. One went, the husband went to one church and the wife went, daddy says, I don't want to see any more of that. He, but that was one of the things that they did out there too. But they were all related, yeah. Do you have any family heirlooms that were passed down that mean a lot to you? Uh, no, uh, I don't. I have some pictures, but I don't have any anything else that I wish I did. And that is why I'm making a point to save everything that I have. <laughs> And like that bell, that's, there's a big bell hanging outside. That's my husband's family. His father had that bell on the farm in Mississippi. And we were able to get that. And he re redid it and painted it and all and put it up there. But, but, but that's one of the few things we have from his family. And uh, so our kids are, that's the one thing, you don't get rid of that. That stays in the family, you know. It's very, very. It's maybe eighteen hundred something. Is what the date is in it. But uh, no, uh, I don't think there's there's much left. Uh, physical things, you know, uh, just some pictures which I try to keep up with, and I have pictures of my father and his father together, and uh, things like that. But uh, no. Uh, I don't can't think of any any artifacts really that I have. Is there anything you like you would like to cover that we haven't addressed? No. Uh, well, one thing I want to say about Obita today is uh, it must be a great place to live because here a few years ago, well, quite a few years ago, when I was starting, I was doing a lot of painting and. Uh, I 
I did a whole thing, a lot of pic paintings for, uh, about Old Lovita. And uh, I went out there and just drove around and went down to where the pool used to be, which they covered it up. It's not there anymore, but there's a park down there, the children's park and things. And, uh, and I went down there to, just to take some pictures and look around, and there was some women down there playing with their kids. And uh, I, I told them, I said, do you mind if I take some pictures? Because I didn't know what I was going to do, but I was going to do some series of paintings on Ovita. And they said, yes, it was okay. And, and I said, would you mind telling me, because they, they weren't from there. And I said, why did you move here? And they said, well, we researched before we moved. And they came from out of state. And this just was the best place to move, to raise your kids. They checked it out. They said, this is a very family-oriented town. They have a lot of things for kids, and it's, 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 it's just a very, it's the ideal place to raise a family. I thought, well, that's great. So then I go to another place in Oviedo, another place like that. There's some more families there. I asked the same question, got the same answer. I said, now, isn't that amazing? That That's saying a lot for Oviedo. It is. And another thing, the townhouse restaurant. Are you familiar with that? I wish they're fixing to the move, you know. Yeah. But uh, we go out there every now and then just to eat there. But uh, I remember when it wasn't a townhouse. And up above it, there used to be a doctor's office above that place. But uh, that corner there, but the, the red light, the whole time I was growing up, that was the red light. The only one in town for many, many years, and I kind of hate to see them do what they're going to do there, but that's progress. And uh, but, uh, now I have very fond memories of me. But you know, when you're growing up, you always think something's going to be better somewhere else. But uh, my daughter lives out there, and right down the road, you know, coming from back to Ovita from her house, there's a new subdivision. It's called Allen Landing or something. They're building. It's got the all in name in it. It's just new. They just started building it. So that's something too. And of course they got all in Avenue, you know, out there by the cemetery. So yeah, it's uh, good memories from Mobile. And I need to get back out there because I have, still have people out there that I know. Uh, are you, how how much more are y'all doing? Do, do you have more people you're going to interview? Because I knew somebody would be good for the interview. <laughs> oh, I'm sure other classes, yeah. like I said, you know, which, which every new semester, because Richard wants uh -huh. to get as much of right. Central Florida's history as possible. So mm -hmm. if you want to. Uh, the wards, uh, there's a uh, Bob Ward. Uh, his brother's passed away, but Bob and, Ward, Bob and Joanne Ward, I would recommend uh, talking to, to them. Uh, they live out there close to where I live, right across the street from the Wheeler house. The, we used to call Mrs. Wheeler, Mrs. B.F. Frank Wheeler, oh, the queen. And, uh, and she was like a queen. You know, she didn't speak to you. You speak to them. I'll never forget one time since I've been when after I moved to, to uh, Sanford, we had the drugstore downtown called Tustin's Drugstore. In those days, it had a soda fountain, just like the Volvita had a soda fountain in it. it. Had a soda fountain in it, and I was down there one day sitting in a booth, and uh, Miss Wheeler came by, and I recognized her, and she recognized me, you know, and she walked right on by and didn't speak. Let's speak. And goes on down and oh god, every booth wasn't full, of course. But so she comes back and then all of a sudden she remembered who I was because she needed a place to sit. <laughs> I thought that was not that's pretty good. <laughs> that was the way it was. They were a little bit a little bit that way. A little bit that way. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Enjoy it.